John chapter 11, verses 37 through 45. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, The Ties That Bind. Hallelujah. The Ties That Bind. John chapter 11, verses 37 through verse 45. I read, as always, from the King James text. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that even this man should not have died? Speaking of Lazarus. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him, and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary, and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. Hallelujah. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, King Jesus, Lord, we love you, we love you, we love you. We thank you for the spirit of encouragement and inspiration that we feel in the house of God today. We thank you, Lord, today for the knowledge that you receive us, imperfect humanity. You receive us. For unlike those who live their lives as if God does not even exist, we have faith. We believe you're real. We believe you manifested yourself to us in the person of the historic man, Jesus Christ. We believe that that man, the Christ, was God incarnate. That he went to the cross that he might be offered in sacrifice for the sins of all humanity. And those who will believe and embrace and obey this great gospel have every hope of salvation in spite of any imperfection, in spite of any flaw in our lives, for it is our faith the Word of God declares that is accounted unto God as righteousness on our behalf. Oh, Master, how we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost today. I love the message you placed in my spirit, and I want so much to deliver this word accurately. I want to deliver it as you would have me to deliver it, that it might bless, inspire, and encourage all those who are listening today. Anoint your speaker, I cannot do it alone. Anoint, touch the ear of every hearer. 
Oh God, that their heart might be prepared to receive this wonderful word this afternoon. Oh, how we ask it today, Lord, and none other than Jesus' powerful, wonderful, saving name. Amen. Praise God. And amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Back in 2000, I spent two months in the hospital at Yelna Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. For a month, I was on life support. I had contracted a, a parasite while visiting Europe, the United Kingdom to be specific. It took doctors a year and a half to figure out that I had this parasite. In the meantime, I had lost half my body weight. I was down to skin pulled over bones. And then uh, one, the summer of 2000, I went through three different hospitalizations as they tried to figure out what was going on with me. And finally, they figured it out. And finally, they began to treat me for this parasite but then I contracted double pneumonia and I wound up the doctor told me when I went in to see him and they did an x-ray of my chest he said your lungs are literally so full of fluid he said I honestly don't even know how you're sitting here talking to me right now he said you shouldn't even be able to retain consciousness that's how full your lungs are he said, I don't know if we're going to be able to save you. They wheeled me across the street to Yellow Haven Hospital. Uh, his office was right across the street. Put me in a hospital bed. I woke up many days later. I went unconscious. I woke up several days later. My mother, who was living in Texas at the time, and here I was in New England, in Connecticut, my mother was standing beside the bed. My stepfather was there. My hands were tethered to the little gates on either side of the hospital bed. They had these uh, leather type belts, you know, that went around my wrists and held them to the sides of the bed. I'm going to tell you, there is nothing worse in this world than being tethered. There is nothing worse in this world than being in a place where you cannot freely move. And you have no choice in the matter. Someone else has bound you up. They've tied you up and you cannot move. Eventually, they asked me, I was on life support, I was fully intubated, and they asked me if we untether your hands can you promise us that you will not try to pull the tubing out of your throat and out of your nose and etc and of course I shook my head yes and they untethered me and boy I'm going to tell you what a difference between being tied up and being free what a difference you don't appreciate folks it's like people in America today. We got a whole bunch of people in America today that are as ignorant and stupid as bricks. They gripe and complain that their freedoms are being infringed upon. Hallelujah, glory to God. Oh, life is so terrible in America today. We've got an idiot running for president who tells us how miserable America is today. How terrible America is today. What an idiot. You can get your hands tied and see how you feel when they're finally untied. Let me tell you, when you really lose your liberties, then tell me how terrible things are today. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Hitler said, through the clever use of propaganda, you can make people believe that heaven is hell and hell is heaven. And that's exactly what's happening in our country today. 
idiots are being convinced that everything is so terrible and everything is going to hell and oh my god the world's going to collapse the sky is falling the sky is falling no it's not my god we're still the freest country in the world we're still sending missionaries around the globe to every nation every tribe every kindred every people my god we're still able to go to the church of our choice and hear the message that we embrace and we believe There's a difference. Let them get to the place, Tommy, where things are really the way they're claiming they are now. Let it really happen. And all of a sudden, they're going to be looking back at today and wishing we could get back to here. Because... You never appreciate your freedom till your freedom has genuinely been taken away. That sensation of being tethered to that bed was terrifying, to be honest. It was horrifying. It, it, it was a terrible thing. Sometimes when the Lord is trying to do something he will ask us to be a part of the work that He is doing. We must sometimes assist Him in untying our neighbor from whatever it is that binds them up and hinders them. Just as the Lord called for the mourners, friends, and family members of Lazarus he called upon them first to roll away the stone he called upon them next after Lazarus emerges from the tomb I can only imagine he must have hopped out like a bunny rabbit because he was bound up like a mummy his body was bound so I imagine he just had to kind of hop out of that old tomb and then being wrapped around with grave cloths, the Lord said to his friends and his family who were standing nearby, Loose him and let him go. Oh, Jesus was doing something powerful. Jesus was doing something miraculous. And yet, he allowed Lazarus grieving friends and family listen to be part of the miracle oh i want to tell you a lot of times god will allow us to be part of the miracle i believe today that god wants to do something powerful something massive here in alabama and he wants us to be part of that miracle. Hallelujah. He wants us to be part of what he's doing. He's not simply going to do it by himself. But he's calling upon us to help roll the stone away. He's calling upon us to help take the grave clothes off of those who are bound and tied up with condemnation and guilt and false teaching. Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes the situation is so dark and dismal that people find themselves within the clutches of death, unable to breathe, never mind being able to move or function. You ever been in that place spiritually <coughs> where you just feel like you're dead? You just don't. I've said it before. I've been doing affirming ministry for 30 years. Every minute of it has been hard. Every 
minute of it. Now we've had people at times, we've had a small congregation of folks at times, but it's always up and down. There's always drama. There's always foolishness. You gain people, you lose people. You, we can't hardly get something going and get it moving, but that thing start to move in the negative direction. And then things will pick up again, and after a while it goes back down. It's constantly like this. Been this way for 30 years. That was not my experience when pastoring in the mainstream. We come to Alabama, and I felt like, now I'm not saying I was right, feelings can betray you, but I felt like we were preaching into the wind, so to speak. I felt like we'd been here for a year, and we can't get anybody to come to church and help us. I felt like, Lord... Every Sunday I'm going up in front of that camera and I'm preaching for the benefit of our many, many online members, our extended members. But we're accomplishing nothing locally. Nothing is happening locally. And I literally made a post on Facebook. I began to wonder if maybe we hadn't missed God in coming to Alabama. I said, Lord... It's been a year. Haven't got a soul, not one soul. You have no idea what I'd pay today to have one stinking person who believed in what we're doing that was willing to get up on Sunday and come to church at 3 o'clock and worship with us and pray with us and help us do something. One person! I'm not asking for a mega church. <coughs> I'll be honest with you, I have no... I have no desire to pastor a mega church. Never have. Some people say, well, that's crazy. Every preacher wants to pastor a mega Why? Why? So they can make more money? You know, so they can be more popular, so they can appear, so that they can feed their ego, you know. Oh, I pastor a church with thousands of people, bless God. That tells you how wonderful I must be. I have no interest in a mega church. If God gave me one, I wouldn't know what to do with it. So, so he'd have to really, really, really prepare me to be able to deal with that because it's not anything I have any desire for. The pastor who ordained me back in 1994 said to me, Brother Alvin said to me, he said, Brother Charles, he said, I could see you pastoring a church with thousands upon thousands of people. He said, I literally, this man, mind you, pastored a mainstream Pentecostal church. And he said, I could see you pastoring thousands upon thousands of people. He said, the ministry God's given you could easily accommodate that. And I looked at him and I said, brother... I wouldn't know what to do with all that. I'd say, I don't have any desire. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You ain't never met a preacher who's less into ego than I am. I'm not interested in having something so I can brag about it. No, no. I just want God to do something. But I know by the testimony of Scripture that God works with us to do things. He doesn't just do it all by himself. So I have to make myself available to him. So he can do, he can do, he can do, he can do whatever it is he wants to do. Hallelujah. Oh, I've told Tommy, I don't know, probably a thousand times. I said, I hunger, I long for a church because even as a preacher, I'm still a believer, folks. I still need a church. I still need the comfort and the encouragement of the fellowship of God's people not having that this afternoon is difficult for me I've been going through this crap for years talk about a valley I'm not complaining this afternoon but I'm trying to help you understand sometimes circumstances 
are beyond your control. I've tried to pray sometimes and I literally, literally just can't even pray. I can't find the words. I don't even know what to ask God for anymore. I've struggled so hard to try to bring this message and this ministry to people straight, gay, cross-eyed, and blind who need a positive, progressive, spirit-filled message. I've tried so hard and for all my efforts, look what I have to show for it. That's left me feeling so devastated and so beat up and tired emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. I'm exhausted. And sometimes I lay on my bed and I want to pray, I want to talk to the Lord about it and I'll open my mouth and I'll go, I don't even know what to say. You ever been there? You ever felt like you were breathing but you were dead? Felt like you were free to get up and move but you were bound? Felt like you were alive and yet at the same time you just had no ability to move and function because there's so much weight on you. So much trauma, so much frustration, so many anxieties. And I tell the truth today, you ever been there? I've been there, folks. I live there. <laughs> That's my address. Sometimes we're in the tomb, just like Lazarus was. Man, it's dark, it's dank. It's dismal. Our situation is so hopeless. It is so difficult. We are so tied up and bound. We feel lifeless and dead. There we lay in the tomb. Am I telling the truth? And the only thing that's going to get us up <laughs> is a miracle. When I first left church in 89 because of a circumstance occurring which in essence forced me to come out so to speak although up until then I had never done anything as a gay man but I was <sighs> people come across something that made them think I was let's put it that way and that's all the church needed to turn its back on me to cuss me to criticize me, to condemn me, to call me everything from a child molester to a pervert. Had a Pentecostal preacher cussing me with the F word. Listen to this, telling me he didn't want me around his wife and daughters. Yeah, because gay men are a real terror to women, aren't they? Don't tell me about going through some hardship. Don't tell me about the church really spitting on you and treating you bad. Honey, been there, bought the t-shirt. And for four years, I lay in the grave thinking that I was dead, that I had no hope, that everything was lost, that my faith didn't matter. God didn't give a fig about my faith. My faith wasn't good enough because I wasn't able to be something that I'm not. Four years, I lay in the tomb. And I'm going to tell you, so I used to tell the Lord, the Lord used to try to talk to me. And I'd say, Lord, it'll take a miracle. If you ever think you're going to see me step foot in the church again, it'll take a miracle. But honey, I'm here to tell you, not only am I in church, I've been there for 30 years. And even when I've been preaching by myself and there wasn't nobody else in the building, I've still been preaching. I've still been going. I've still been worshiping. I've still been praying. I've still been believing because my when God called me out of the tomb, I'm here to tell you, I found life again. 
And as the old song says, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We may find ourselves in a place so dark and dank and dismal that even if we could find the strength to move, we'd never be able to make our way out of the door as it is blocked by a massive weighty stone. When we find ourselves at such a place as this, we need a little help from our friends. <laughs> Hallelujah. Roll ye away the stone. Alabama, Huntsville, oh hallelujah. Tommy and I are here today to roll away the stone. Glory to God. If you're lying in that old tomb, if you're lying in that place where you feel so dead, you feel so helpless, you feel so hopeless, you're bound and you just cannot see your way back to life. I'm here to tell you God has sent somebody to this community to roll away the stone. Yes, Lord. Glory to God. Sometimes we need a little help from our friends. Sometimes the Lord uses us so that we might be part of the greater miracle. A lame man was carried by his friends to Jesus and lowered down through the roof of a house where Jesus was speaking inside so that he might be healed. Do you remember the story in the Word of God? It was the efforts of that layman's friends which secured his miracle. He could never have received that much needed healing otherwise. He didn't have the strength nor the ability to push his way through crowds to make his way to the feet of Jesus. But thank God, like Lazarus, this man had friends. Oh, hallelujah. Too many today undervalue or do not appreciate the importance of corporate worship and the fellowship of God's people. We often miss the benefits of our fellow believers, prayer, worship, faith, and obedience, allowing us to fully experience that which we need from the Lord. And the reason we wind up not receiving from the Lord that which we need is because we decided to go it alone. Thank God Lazarus had friends. Thank God his friends, oh my God, I'm going to shout something today. I'm telling you folks. Thank God his friends were willing to obey the Lord. <laughs> Roll ye away the stone. Martha said, by now he stinketh. But they still rolled the stone away. <laughs> they could have stood there and argued with him. Could have stood there and fought with him. Could have tried to convince him it was a bad idea. I'm going to tell you, when Tommy got a job offer for Huntsville, Alabama, I didn't think it was altogether a good idea. I knew he's black, I'm white, problem number one. And we're gay, problem number two. I said, my God, Alabama, of all the places on planet Earth, for God to open a door for us to go, it would be Alabama. But we had been praying for 15 months for a job to open up for Tommy. I said, Lord, I believe if you'll open the door, we'll walk through it. I don't care where it is. Look at the door he opened.
If you think I wasn't looking at Jesus, say, Lord, by now he stinks. <laughs> if you think I was looking toward heaven and saying, Lord, are you sure you know what you're doing? I still do it sometimes. I still feel that way so far since we've been here. No support, nobody coming to help us. But you know what? We still moved. I'm going to tell you folks, you have never in your life gone through what Tommy and I went through to make this relocation. I've got diabetes. I'm living with chronic leukemia, CML. I get tired just walking around a grocery store to the point that when I get home, all I can do is sleep for hours, literally. And yet, he had to be up here weeks before we were even able to get our house in Dallas listed on the market. I had to stay in Dallas. I had to handle listing our house. I had to handle the entire logistics of the move. I had to hire people to help me pack boxes. I had to hire people to help me pack the moving containers. I had to hire moving containers. I had to rim you whole truck to get the last of our stuff up here. I had to make three or four or five trips up here and back in a vehicle pulling trailers and doing things because I have uh, stuff that needs to be carried on a trailer like a UTV and what have you. And so I had to do all this back if I'm doing all this. I thought I was going to die. And I am not exaggerating. I never told Tommy because he was up here trying to start a new job staying in our camper at a campground over here by NASA. And I wouldn't tell Tommy how hard it was on me. I wouldn't tell him how much I was struggling because I didn't want to put any more pressure on him than he was already going through. I thought to heavens I was going to drop dead. Literally, there were days I was so tired I was pushing my body so far beyond anything I have done in years. Wound up costing us out of the proceeds of the sale of our house in Dallas. This move wound up costing us almost $50,000. But I told the Lord, wherever you open the door, I'm going to believe that's where you want us to go. And Lord, I'm not going to complain. I'm going to go. Whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. And we did. It cost us a fortune. I thought I was going to die. It was so difficult. But when Jesus said, roll ye away the stone, guess what, honey? That stone wasn't light. It wasn't easy. But they found a way to move it. The stone that God asked me to roll away wasn't light. It wasn't easy. But I'm going to obey God. Hallelujah. I'm going to do what the Lord told me to do. I made a covenant with Him. Lord, you open the door wherever, however, wherever. I don't care. I'll walk through whatever door you open. And when He spoke, roll ye away the stone. I said, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. And got busy. Too many people lose out on the blessings, the miracles they need from God because they've separated themselves from the church of the living God. But Lazarus had friends. I love to have a church because I know when I got a good church full of good people who love the Lord as much as I do, I know I've got friends. 
I know I've got people who will pray for me when I need prayer. I know I've got people who will lay hands on me when I need hands laid on me. Hello now. I've got people who can believe God for a miracle when I need a miracle. I don't have that right now. I miss it. I'm not one of those foolish people who thinks you can be a Christian and not go to church. Baloney, that's not what the Bible says. It's not what the Word of God teaches. You do not separate yourself from the flock and expect to be prosperous and blessed. No, when you separate yourself from the flock of God, when you remove yourself from being under the tutelage of a godly shepherd, you make yourself vulnerable. You put yourself in a bad, bad position. Thank God Lazarus had friends. Thank God his friends were willing to obey the Lord on his behalf. The Lord asked his mourning friends and relatives to roll away the stone. And after calling Lazarus out of the grave, he instructed those same friends and family members to loose him and let him go. What good was it to Lazarus to be alive and well if he wasn't free to move about as normal. Oh, children, listen to me today. When we obey the Lord, it often contributes to our neighbors being unfettered from that which binds and confines them. When we worship the Lord, we often loose the shackles about the hands and feet of those who are nearby and hear us. In Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, Paul and Silas had been placed in prison. They were put in shackles in the deepest dungeon of the prison. The Word of God declares, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Listen. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open. And everyone's, everyone's, everyone's bands were loosed. Only Paul and Silas, listen to me children, only Paul and Cyrus, Silas were praying and singing praises. But God liberated the whole prison. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And the prisoners heard them. And the Lord loosed the bonds and opened the doors. Not just for Paul and Silas, but for the whole prison. You know what I like to have? A church, you know what I like to be surrounded by God's people? Because sometimes we come into the house of God and 98% of us are struggling. 98% of us are having a difficult time. 98% of us have had a bad week. 98% of us are wore out and tired and miserable and feel like we can barely move. Oh, but thank God there's that 2%. Oh, glory, there's that Paul and Silas in church. You know, sister shout a lot and brother dance the aisles. Hallelujah. Oh, and we begin to sing the songs of Zion. We begin to sing the great old hymns of the church. And all of a sudden, sister shouts a lot. Let's out with a whoop. Woo! Glory! And brother dance a lot. Starts to dance and worship God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, and guess what? All the prisoners heard them. Oh, hallelujah. And before too long, the whole church is on fire. Before too long, we're all shouting the victory. Before too long, we're all running the aisles. And 
and dancing under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Because sometimes we need a little help from our friends. Out of a prison full of prisoners, one but two of them praying and worshiping, but everybody heard them. And when God sent down His Spirit to shake things up, everybody benefited from the shakeup. Oh, hallelujah. You wonder why we Pentecostal folks shout. You wonder why we dance. You wonder why our worship is so demonstrative and energetic. Well, first of all, it's because our faith is real. If you can go to a ball game and scream your lungs out because some stupid ball has crossed a white line, why can't I shout about my eternal salvation? Why can't I let out a victory whoop? Because the Spirit of the Lord has touched me and made me feel victorious even though at the moment I may be going through one of the toughest trials of my life. Second Corinthians 3.17 Now the Lord is that Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. Mark 16, 14 through 20, afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. Listen, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The Lord does not need our help to do the wonderful or to perform the miraculous. But we need His help to accomplish either of these things. Fallen man does not need to see or know what the Lord can do by Himself. Did you hear me today? Listen to me. Those who are unsaved today, they don't need to know what God can do by Himself. The struggling child of God doesn't need to know what God can do by Himself. They need to see, listen, what the Lord can do in, with, and through them. Philippians 4, 10 through 14, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. 
Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now I'm going to read that to you from the NIV because I know that that passage doesn't necessarily read real clear for many people. The NIV said, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. You see, people don't need to know, Tommy, what God can do. He's God. We know He can do anything and everything. They need to know what He can do through them, what He can help them do. Oh, hallelujah. Our message is not today, look, this is what God can do. But rather our message is this, look, this is what you are capable of. Because of the presence and power of Jesus Christ in your life. You can walk in victory. You don't always need to feel alone. You don't always have to be depressed. You do not always have to struggle and suffer. You need not always lay motionless in a tomb of despair and futility. Because this preacher is here and I will happily help you to experience the power of God in your life. Glory to God. Oh, I'm more than happy to loose you and set you free. I'm more than happy to obey God and help you find liberty and freedom in the Holy Ghost. Oftentimes the Lord is trying to do something wonderful in the life of our brother or sister in the faith. But He requires us to exercise faith on their behalf. He requires us to act in obedience. Even when we do not understand His direction or think that which He is telling us to do is a bad idea. Surely by now He stinketh, said Mary. Come on, believer! Now is not the time to question the Lord. <laughs> he knows what He's doing even when we don't. Ours is not to question why. Ours is but to do or die as the old saying goes. This phrase in reality is a transliterated version of the line. Theirs is but... Uh, uh, Theirs not to reason why, theirs but to do and die, which was written by Alfred Lord Tennyson in his 1854 poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. As children of God, we're to be good soldiers who understand the importance and the necessity of the chain of command. If we know who our commander-in-chief is, the Lord Jesus Christ, maker of heaven and earth, then we ought never question His direction or disobey, listen to me now children, His direct orders. Roll ye away the stone. Ours is not to question why. Loose Him and let Him go. Ours is not to question why. Just obey. The chain of commands there for a reason. When a soldier's given an order, what's his job? To do it. Sometimes the Lord asks us to give that homeless person our coat. He may ask us to put a $20 bill in the hands of a fellow church member. He might direct us to go to a certain place at a certain time so that we can speak with someone a word of encouragement or offer a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. 
in an hour when such a word is desperately needed. The proper function of the church depends heavily upon God's people obeying the direction offered by the Spirit of God. In Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. There is nothing more glorious than being witness to a changed life or a divine miracle. But we, as God's people, often forfeit our opportunity to participate in such an event by refusing to be obedient to, to the direction of God's Spirit. If there's one lesson we almost learned today, it is the lesson offered by the story of the Lord's first public miracle at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. Roll ye away the stone. Fill the water pots with water. See, the Lord's letting them be part of the miracle. Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, loose him, and let him go. He's letting them be part of the miracle. Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, or where it came from, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. Folks, I'm closing up today. We're, we are today in Huntsville, Alabama because our God has great plans for a place. I'm going to talk plain. If you get offended easy, then turn the channel. For a place that is soaked in ignorance, malice, hatred, and religious fervor run amok. Someone here needs our help, Tommy. It is the Lord who is about to do something grand. But he has called upon us to be his assistants. Somebody here needs our help to find freedom. Somebody here is living a life that is not at all like the life they once knew and loved. They need our assistance in making their way back into the world of the living. Somebody here wants to worship and serve the Lord, but for many years their hands have been tied and their mouths have been gagged. And the Lord has sent us to this place so that we might assist in removing the gag and cutting them loose from their hindrances of fear and self-doubt. We've come to this city 
a place that we never in a million years imagined we would ever live because we believe that the Lord guides our path and orders our steps. We came convinced that no matter how great the obstacles and forceful the opposition, our God is bigger and more powerful and able to do that which needs to be done. Oh, hallelujah. If he can breathe life back into the body of Lazarus, his friend whom he loved, with nothing more than the word of his mouth, then he can breathe life into the lifeless, parched bones of a people who have been left dead, defeated, and seemingly destroyed in a valley of despair and desolation. Again, he'll use little more than his word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, which I strive to preach faithfully Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Oh, dear friend, I don't know about you, but I feel the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord today. Do not despair or hesitate to do today what the Lord is instructing you to do. Like Lazarus, listen to me, like Lazarus, not his friends now, but like Lazarus himself, do not hesitate to hear the Master's voice. And to heed his command when he speaks to you in the deepest dungeon of death and despair, declaring, Lazarus, come forth. Hallelujah. He spoke to his friends and said, Roll ye away the stone. But he spoke to Lazarus, the dead man, and said, Lazarus, come forth. Some of you are watching me right now and the Holy Ghost is speaking to you. Lazarus, come forth. Oh, hallelujah. Come out of your grave. <laughs> come out of your dead place. Come out of that place of unhappiness. Come out of that place. You know what life in Christ is like. You know what living for God is like. You know the blessing and the favor of the Almighty. When you walk by faith, the just shall live by faith. You know that as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Honey, it's time to listen to the voice of the Lord. He's saying, come forth. You come forth and we'll help loose the bands. Amen. We'll help loose the ties that bind. Oh, hallelujah! Glory to God! It is the ties that bind us together as members of God's family of faith, listen, that often wind up being the source of our being unfettered from the ties that bind us. Oh, hallelujah.